Thanks, to organizer, for the invitation. So uh, I'd like to report some recent results on uh, this problem called random graph matching. Um, and the, the talk is mainly about a, a algorithm. And I will discuss some connections to the computational threshold possibly along the way. And this is joint work with Jamie in the, in the audience, uh, Cheng Mao in Georgian Tech, and, and Sophie, who is graduating and joining Wharton soon. Um, okay, so I was. So I, um, I'll start with maybe some high level motivation and motivating examples for this paradigm and called uh, graph matching or network alignment. So uh, one of the examples uh, comes from uh, uh, social network analysis where the goal is to denonymize uh, uh, one network based on uh, the other. So let's say you have two social networks um, here um, um, for the same group of users. Uh, they use their real name on one, and then they use some account name on the other, and you want to de denonymize this uh, anonymized ver version uh, based on the fact that these two social networks are reasonably uh, correlated in the sense that uh, two people are friends on one, and then they have a higher likelihood to be friends on the other, and this, uh, but, not, but this is not guaranteed, of course. Uh, and then the same correlation happens for uh, non-friends as well. So, uh, and the denonymization will eventually tells you who is Bob, who is Alice, and so on and so forth. And uh, these arrows is essentially a uh, matching between two set of verses. So this has been, um, um, this type of uh, problem has been uh, implemented with a lot of engineer, engineering uh, hacks uh, that leads to very scaringly uh, accuracy in terms of denonymizing uh, big social networks and also Netflix data set. So, and the second example comes from a computational biology where the two networks are uh, arose from a biological applications, in particular, the so-called PPI network, protein to protein interaction network, uh, and, and for, for two different species. Um, and here, the we have more data for mouse PPI network and less for human, and the, the underlying correlation comes from the fact that uh, the same proteins uh, um, interact with each other uh, due to the same uh, chem uh, chemical uh, uh, mechanisms, so on and so forth. And the goal is try to identify this matching. And this has been uh, applied in quite successfully in uh, a few uh, uh, biological uh, research uh, papers. And the third application, and this last one I'll mention, is in computer vision, where the two networks are, uh, let's say, mesh networks that comes from uh, 3D shapes, right? So you triangulate the surface, you get one network, and then you do the same for this, the other shape. So the correlations simply come from the fact that uh, these two things are very similar, uh, but there's also noise. For example, there are um, local uh, measurement errors, and there is also more global big topological changes, right? So here the hands touch the leg and here there is, will be a uh, no such shortcut, right? So there's, but you can still reasonably assume these two networks are correlated. And the goal is to say, for, for instance, are they the same? If it's deemed to be the same, uh, identify the matching. And the matching here would corresponds to uh, these lines that are uh, identify the same regions color coded with the same color. Okay. So uh, before I recast this problem into a uh, combinatorial observation problem, you can already imagine that uh, there are two sorts of challenges uh, that are representative for basically a lot of problems discussing this workshop. One is computational, uh, exhaustive search is definitely not viable even if you only have a hundred vertices and factorial is the number of possible solutions. And the secondly is uh, data are very noisy. Um, so they are correlated, but not exactly the same, right? So in a goal is try to identify some algorithms that uh, hopefully are fast and, uh, and at the same time, probably uh, robust to a certain amount of noise. Yeah, okay, so that's the, the goal. Uh, and then because of this problem is, uh, worst case intractable, which I'll discuss in a second, uh, people turn to meaningful statistical models. So 
And with the hope that developing algorithms that probably works for these uh, meaningful models will hopefully extend well to real data. I think this is a, a good recipe for success. Uh, so a very st uh, stylized, uh, simple model is you take two instances of a training graph and then and they are correlatively uh, generated. So it's a very simple model. And uh, such model was proposed by uh, Parasani and Glaus uh, Gross Glauser uh, 12 years ago. Um, so here uh, I have two instances of graphs, both are drawn from G and Q. That's so early training graph with N nodes and edge density Q. Um, but the edges uh, are essentially uh, uh, pairwise independent. So that's the name of the correlated ER graphs. So with some correlation coefficients row, right? So if you look at, let's say, AIJ and uh, BIJ, they are individually Bernoulli's with correlation coefficients row. So, and uh, of course, there's, uh, that's when you actually know the uh, node correspondence. Uh, if you do not know it, it will be the situation where AIJ and pi pi j are correlated Bernoulli cues. Right? So that's uh, the visualization of the correspondence. More visualization. <laughs> <laughs> and then row, so there are two key parameters. One is the amount of correlation, rho. If rho is equal to one, it's the same problem called the uh, random graph isomorphism but we'll be interested in row that is not equal to one. And then the second important parameter is the sparsity. Uh, N times Q is the average degree. Okay, and the goal is uh, given a graph like this where I do not have any label information. So basically give me the unlabeled version of AMB, uh, re reconstruct the hidden node-wide co correspondence as accurate as possible with high probability when the network size is large. So that's the goal. Okay, so what is the best procedure? The best procedure is essentially solving maximum likelihood. If you write down uh, maximum likelihood, then let's assume that correlation coefficient is positive, then it boils down to solving the so-called optimization problem called quadratic assignment uh, that maximize objective function, which means it's the uh, number of common edges, uh, uh, pretending pi hat being the uh, the underlying true correspondence and uh, searching over all possible uh, matchings and maximize the number of common edges, right? So maximally align these two networks. So the name quadratic sum comes from the fact that if you write this objective function in a linear algebra uh, style, it will have A and uh, pi B pi transpose uh, in a product together where pi being the, uh, the permutation matrix, right? So this is the quadratic nature of, of, of this problem has the name QAP. And if you only have one pi, it's called a linear uh, assignment. And that is an easy problem to solve. And I'll come back to this uh, in a second. So maximum likelihood is very uh, costly to compute. And this problem arises first in operation research. It's even uh, more difficult than TSP, traveling salesperson's problem, where you take B to be a Hamiltonian cycle. So it's a problem that is, um, Although its statistical uh, performance is great, it's basically achieves the information theoretic optimum, um, but it's very hard to compute uh, or even approximate in the worst case. So, uh, but dealing with average case, maybe there is a hope of computing something uh, approximately uh, uh, like QAP then still works well and enjoy the same uh, strong statistical guarantees, right? So that's, um, that's roughly the, the high level goal. Okay, so let me discuss uh, moving away from this computationally intractable uh, methods to those that are more tractable. So the state of affairs of uh, polynomial time algorithms are summarized as follows. So I will uh, focus my kind of frame my discussion using this table where the rows are indexed by the amount of correlation, right? So there is the extreme high correlation and then high correlation when rho is very, very close to one. Uh, and then there is low correlation, let's say rho is a constant 0.5. There's also extremely low correlations. <laughs> I would say that later. 
right, zero, sure. <laughs> uh, good. So the uh, and then uh, the in the vertically there is the sparsity. So sparse here means average degree is some uh, uh, sub uh, sub polynomial n, and dense means is some polynomial n. Okay, so uh, going back to the 80s, the special case, uh, like I mentioned earlier, rho equal to one is known as a random graph isomorphism. So random graph isomorphism for Rajrani instances is easy to solve as shown by a sequence of work. Basically it can be solved in linear time. And then uh, later on, uh, this result by Dai et al. Uh, show that if rho is not one, but polynomially close to one, uh, there is a simple algorithm basically looking at degrees uh, that can uh, figure out the matching with high probability. And then later on, uh, a sequence of uh, a pair of papers using different method, uh, this uh, one over poly n is improved to one over poly log n. Right? So basically uh, you can modify uh, one over log n number of edges to create two correlated copies. And still there are certain polynomial time efficient methods uh, this one is based on uh, empirical distribution of degrees of neighbors called degree profile. And this one is a spectral method that both uh, uh, reconstruct the uh, matching successfully with high probability, right? So this is uh, still, all of this is operating under the regime where rho is vanishing close to one. Uh, and then this is also improved to poly log log n <laughs> a few years later. Uh, so when I move to the second row uh, of high correlation, I meant row is no longer one minus little of one. Uh, so these three uh, papers presented uh, algorithms uh, that are devoted to sparse graphs only, leveraging the uh, local tree-like structure of sparse Rajrani graphs that has the promise to succeed when row is uh, one minus some unspecified constant but it's not going to zero. But they are limited to sparse graphs only. Uh, and then I also need to uh, mention uh, the hidden fourth row of extremely low correlation, where rho is vanishing, uh, goes to zero. And there is a very nice work uh, by Barak et al. that proposed the algorithm that works in time n to the log n and that succeeds with high probability. So this, uh, our work also draws uh, inspiration from this one as well because it's also based on subgraph counts. Okay, so the question is, uh, is, is it possible to have an algorithm that runs in uh, poly time that can deal with a low correlation um, and also it, it works for both dense and sparse graphs? And that's this work. So uh, we, uh, the algorithm I will describe uh, uh, achieves a very specific uh, constant called Alter's constant, so when rho is either bigger than root alpha or less than minus root alpha, uh, this special constant, uh, there is an algorithm that succeeds. And this works for both sparse and dense graphs. And this alpha is, uh, uh, is alters tree counting constant, which play the following role. If you count number of unlabeled trees with uh, n edges, it grows exponentially with exponent being uh, one over alpha. Okay, and there is an increasing amount of evidence. Sorry? The base. Oh, the base, sorry, yeah, not the exponent. <laughs> Thank you. And there is uh, uh, more and more evidence suggests that this constant might be the computational threshold uh, for sparse graphs. So it's a very precise statement. Now I'll, I'll say this in a second, a bit more. Okay, so let me formally state the results. The results is under the condition I stated. Uh, there is a polynomial time matching algorithm that succeeds with high probability in the following sense. If average degree is bigger than a constant, then partial recovery is achieved in the sense that a positive fraction of the vertices is correctly matched, right? If a degree goes infinity, then all but a vanishing fraction of the vertices is matched. Then there is under an extra condition that is actually information theoretically uh, necessary, you can uh, match all the vertices simultaneously uh, with high probability. So the, um, and then there is a few uh, additional uh, uh, properties of this algorithm. It's, uh, it's uh, it promised to have no mismatches, right? So it might give you only a, a subset of vertices, subset pair, uh, vertices pairs, but uh, it's guaranteed to be 
uh, correctly matched. Um, and then this condition uh, that uh, is needed to reconstruct the entire matching uh, is information theoretically optimal. And this is known uh, through the previous work of uh, Kulina and Kiyavash. And this can be interpreted as the intersection graph between A and B. So basically edges that are present uh, in, in both uh, has to be above the connectivity threshold. Otherwise you have isolated vertices that won't be able to match uh, forever. And then there is a different algorithm uh, in the paper of uh, Ganasali, Masuri, and Semergen that uh, succeeds under the same threshold uh, only for sparse graphs, uh, but at, at the same author's constant threshold. Um, and the one of the evidence uh, that shows this might be the uh, computational threshold for uh, for uh, for uh, sparse graphs is that uh, one can show that uh, this is the point where local algorithms start to fail. Understood in the usual sense. Uh, I might I may not define it exactly, but let me continue. So perhaps it's. Uh, beneficial to look at a very specific regime where the average degree is uh, log n with some pre-log constant lambda. So sparsity versus correlation is plotted here. And then this is the information theoretic limits, right? So that in the gray region, nothing works. And here, let's say quadratic assignment succeeds. Uh, okay. And then this red line is where the author's constant uh, lies above which there is some algorithm which I'll describe succeeds. And then um, this is the conjectured hard phase. Um, Sorry, what's the curve again? I think it's just one over lambda. Ah. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah, got that one. Okay. Um, Right, so maybe let me say one more. So there's also a very nice uh, paper by uh, uh, Piccio, Picciolo et al. That's uh, in the statistics physics literature that uh, conducted a lot of experiment with uh, message passing type of algorithms that also pointed to this may be the, uh, the, the, the threshold for computational efficient algorithms. And the, and uh, this can be indeed shown to be the case for local algorithms, by which I meant the following. Uh, if you ask me node i in the first graph, is it a good match? To, is it a correct match to node j in the second graph? Uh, local algorithm computes some uh, statistics based on t-hop neighborhood of i in the first graph and t-hop neighborhood of j in the second graph and make a decision to say yes and no. Suppose the algorithm is of this form for constant t, then uh, it won't succeed beyond the author's threshold. So that's what I mean. Okay, so let me describe maybe uh, in two uh, stages, the ideas uh, that construct these algorithms. The first idea is very uh, high level. Uh, so the meta algorithm would be, I want to convert my, my problem from quadratic assignment to linear assignment. So quadratic assignment is hard, linear assignment is easy. And this conversion is achieved by the following. It's not a reduction per se, Course. It's just a recipe for uh, coming up with the algorithm. So the algorithm uh, starts by constructing some node-wide features, which we call signatures, uh, for every node in the first graph and every node in the second graph. So the signatures are some features, could be a number, could be a vector, could be a probability measure, and so on and so forth. So let's call them S. So I have N of them for the first graph somehow constructed. And I do the same thing for B, and the, these signatures are called T's. So then I have some ways to score their similarities, right? So for every uh, two signatures, I compute a number called uh, phi, and this phi should have the um, have the behavior of a similarity score. If the score is high, it indicates that their signatures are similar. Otherwise, it's not, right? So if you think about this as a minus some distance of something like that. And then once I have the uh, uh, similarity scores for every n pairs, I have an n by n matrix on which I just run linear assignment, right? I maximize the total score 
under this postulated uh, similarity scoring. Right. So this is the paradigm of the of the uh, of the algorithm. Of course, the, the difficult part or the, the crux is to construct a reasonable similarity scoring. And then the similarity score should enjoy this property if the algorithm is, is working, that for true pairs, uh, the score should be high. For fake pairs, it should be low, right? But then you have to be uh, careful because for every node, there is one true pair. There's n minus one fake pairs, right? So the fluctuation of these things may, may, might be small on average, could potentially compete with the true, true score, right? So th there's, there's this type of difficulties. Okay, so how do you construct these signatures? Um, then the metropolis or sorry? Then the metropolis? Uh, here I just meant by uh, do linear assignment, right? So I have, uh, I, I compute summation of pi pi i, and I maximize this over all permutation. So this is a linear assignment. You can use combinatorial algorithm to solve it or just solve it as it is a linear program. And then the, the difference is with quadratic assignment, you will have uh, two pies, then no one knows how to solve it. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Any other question? Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you. The vertex signature is different from the degree distribution of the neighbors. Yeah, so this is just a generic template. I didn't say anything about how do you construct the signature, how do you score them. Uh, I'll, I'll give some examples in a second. Uh, yeah, so here they are. So you can take degrees, which is one single number, and then you just compare the degrees, right? And then there is also more sophisticated algorithms using uh, called degree profiles or spectral methods. Um, and I think the, uh, these uh, results that only uh, works for sparse graphs can also be understood from this perspective, but they all kind of um, are, are designed on the, on the premise of the locally tree-like structure. So, so we want to do something that's similar, but still follow this template. And the main idea is to count sub subgraphs. So let me maybe set up some notations. So here I have one graph uh, like this and there's some small subgraphs and uh, the number of copies of H in the uh, uh, graph A is what I mean by a subgraph count. For example, here you can count the number of wedges here, there are a total of six. Okay, it's capture some information about the graphs. You can maybe think about them as some polynomials of, of the uh, JCC matrix. So and so forth. And then it's also, it's used a lot in both theory and practice, sometimes known as motif counting in the um, biological network analysis. And how did you capture uh, the information native to a single node? Because this is what we want, right? We do not want this type of more global information, number of triangles in the graph. And uh, if you want information pertaining to a given node, um, a natural twist on this is to count rooted subgraphs, right? So count number of wedges uh, incident to a given node with that being the root. So in this case, um, um, there are three copies, okay? And then I will do the same for every node, right? So this is one way to construct a feature. And this notation is noted here, uh, with H being the subgraph and A being the J. <laughs> so, and the idea is, and the, and this is also present in the earlier work of Barak et al, is that counting a single uh, graph would not be uh, uh, informative enough, right? So it's, it would be good to construct uh, a rich family of subgraphs and you count all of them and somehow you combine them into uh, signature that allows you to do the similarity scoring much better than just using a single one. So the way we combine them is not the same. And also there's a lot of other differences, but at the high level, um, the signatures will be related to these type of objects. Um, okay, so let me continue. So let's say you have a family of rooted subgraphs. So uh, some examples are given here 
with uh, capital N number of edges, right? So N would be something that you hope is not too big, but probably uh, too small is not a good idea either. So, and then for every node in uh, graph A, its signatures is just a vector of a subgraph count uh, for those in this family. I right? so suppose there are 10, and this is just a 10 dimensional vector. So in, in actual uh, uh, theory, we didn't do this because there's a lot of correlation between these subgraph counts. The number of wedges, number of triangles are probably very highly correlated, yeah. So, and you would hope to get something that is orthogonal to one another so that uh, computing something extra give you some innovation, right? So, so instead, so this can be done at least on this level by centering the JCC matrix. And this can guarantee uh, they are at least uncorrelated, right? So let me parse it. You have the JCC matrix originally and you subtract uh, its expectation and you count the weighted copy. And weighted copy here, it just means you, if you have the original adjacency matrix here, this is the total number of subgraphs. Otherwise, you just have this weighted version, right? This sum product thing. And this was uh, introduced uh, uh, earlier in the paper by Bubak et al. in the context of testing random geometric graph versus urgent drain graph. And uh, they call them sine triangles. So here we uh, use the same name, just so we call them uh, signed subgraph counts. So they are guaranteed, and this is a simple exercise. You can check that it's uncorrelated if you have different subgraphs. Okay, and then you do the same for vertex in, in J, leading to the signature T in the second graph, right? So you have the same uh, vector uh, of the same length, not the same vector. And then the way you score them is to take some inner product, some weighted inner product, and with this number of automorphisms, count, uh, account for the number of symmetries of these graphs. It's also for convenience, essentially, to compute first moment. So this is the similarity score. And then once you compute all of them, you get an N by N matrix, then you run linear assignment and to produce the matching. And then essentially, uh, even for theory, uh, we don't even need to solve linear assignment. You can do something very, very greedy. So essentially, if a score passes the given threshold, you say they are a match, otherwise you say no. And uh, one can also view this maybe at a high level under the framework of low degree algorithms. And uh, these are polynomials of the JCC matrix with degree being the size of the subgraph. Okay. Um, so I, I, I will say a little bit later about how do you compute this because N goes to infinity, right? So if you exhaustively compute, if you uh, brute forcefully compute this thing, it's not going to be in poly time. Right? So, so this needs to be addressed. So let's hold this thought for, for this for now. Okay, so what type of these desired properties of these signatures or similarity score you should have? So I already mentioned that it should be high for true matches, uh, for true pairs, it should be low for fake pairs, right? So, so at least this should be guaranteed, let's say at the expectation level, right? So on average, uh, you should have a high score for true matches, maybe zero for uh, fake pairs. Okay, so, and, uh, and uh, that's exactly uh, what we seek to establish. So one thing you can show that uh, once you put a little bit of structure on these subgraphs, uh, let's say they are uniquely rooted, uh, you can ensure that uh, it has the desired property that it is zero mean for fake pairs and from positive mean for true pairs. And uniquely, uniquely rooted simply means the following, uh, uh, let's just look at these two examples. The wedge is rooted in the middle, is uniquely rooted, and uh, a triangle is not. Okay. If, you, if you swap to another node, it's, uh, it's isomorphic to itself. Okay, so once you have the root uniquely rooted properties, uh, you can ensure that uh, these two things are uncorrelated if they are uh, not the true uh, match. And then by linearity, you get a zero mean. Right. So, and this mu is something uh, that, of course, uh, becomes bigger if correlation is higher. And also, it grows linearly in the number of uh, subgraphs in this family, right? So, there's this uh, rich family leads to 
bigger meal type of phenomena. Okay, so in terms of maybe uh, how we should visualize this thing is that this uh, summary statistics constructed using uh, the sign subgraph count are separated in, in means, right? So then, but of course, this is not enough. You also need to control the fluctuations around the mean, right? Because after all, if you, uh, as I already said, you have n minus one uh, fake pairs, right? That can possibly lead to large fluctuations that overwhelm the separation. So bounding the standard deviation is definitely needed. So ideally, we want to observe a picture like this. You have some Gaussian-like uh, uh, distribution that uh, have very some light tails so that you can put the threshold in the middle and guarantee that uh, they are separated even if you take the maximum number of fake pairs uh, uh, and that still is dominated by the, the true score. Okay. So this leads to really how do you construct this family of, of, of graphs? Um, so let me maybe explain the uh, zeroth order consideration, <laughs> which is which is uh, pretending that uh, these graphs are uh, are actually uh, uh, correlated uh, between different subgraphs. Suppose this is not the case. Suppose this is the case, right? So ignore it for the moment. And then the variance of this sum is just a sum of the variances at which you can compute. And then, then compared to the uh, you know, square of the means, we want to ensure that the second moment is this variance is dominated by the first moment square. Right? So this is the maybe right, the basic consideration. And uh, with this wishful thinking, ignoring these correlations, and one can compute this uh, thing and then show that it is just given by the following. Uh, one over number of subgraphs in your family times uh, row to the 2n, n is number of edges, right? So therefore, if you want this quantity to go to zero, you will need the number of edges to go to infinity, right? possibly slowly. And you also need the number of graphs to grow at least exponentially in number of edges, right? In fact, you will need to have an exponent strictly bigger than uh, uh, one over row. Right, so that's that's where a one over row square. That's where the the main condition of author threshold arises. So to summarize, I will need this fam family of subgraphs to be rich in the sense that it grows exponentially, right, with 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 some prescribed exponent, and these subgraphs also needs to be large. So I will quantify this needed largeness in a second. Uh, and third thing, which I surprised earlier, is that. Uh, we also want the graphs to be sufficiently simple so that you can count them efficiently, right? So better than exhaustive search. Okay. So turns out that uh, one choice that fulfill all three of them is trees. So for trees, for, for now, let's just take all trees. And uh, thanks to the theorem of alter, uh, number of trees grows like one over alpha to the n. And this leads to rho square times alpha bigger than one type of condition, the main condition. And, uh, and the trees are also simple enough to count uh, thanks to a uh, by now classical results of algorithm of uh, along et al called color coding. So it's a way, it's a randomized algorithm that count uh, certain subgraphs uh, in polynomial time. So essentially, Exhaustive search will need a uh, uh, time that is n to the capital N. Uh, and for trees, uh, this type of uh, approximation algorithm runs in time uh, poly n times e to the capital N, right? So cho choosing capital N to be uh, big of log n will lead to algorithm that is overall polynomial in n, yeah. Okay. And then, of course, the difficult part of this, the main technical uh, bulk of this paper is that uh, one did, does need to account for correlations between different subgraphs. And this is not something that can be ignored. Okay, so this, uh, basically one needs to undo this wishful thinking now uh, to in fact compute this second moment more precisely. Right, so 
Uh, and then the solution, our solution that we came up with is to construct a, a further special uh, subfamily of trees. So uh, I should clarify that when I say we need to is because uh, uh, maybe we don't need to, maybe counting all trees is enough, uh, but the technical analysis that we were able to do require, require us to essentially to call a lot of the, uh, right, to throw away a lot of the trees, only focus on the special of them. So maybe maybe it's possible also to not do this. Okay, so let, let me describe uh, the, main, the main construction. Uh, okay, so the form of the similarity score is the same, except I need to describe exactly what uh, trees that we work with. So these trees should suppress the undesired cross correlation between these terms so that they are roughly have the behavior I described uh, so that this variance divided by first moment square uh, goes to zero is still guaranteed under the main author threshold condition. And this uh, trees also needs to be rich enough, right? I do not want to compromise the author threshold. So this, this is the actual family of trees that we counted. It's a very special tree in the sense that the fraction of this type of things is little of one, but the, in terms of exponent is the same as before. So this is a living chandelier from uh, Jamin's house. <laughs> and uh, the, so let me describe this type of special trees. So it has three parameters, uh, branches is number of, yeah, like number of branches. And every branch uh, starts from the root with a long path of length M, which we call the wire, followed by a bulb. A bulb is just some generic tree with K edges and that are not too symmetric, okay? And then you do it for every branch. So this is the description of a chandelier. And uh, the capital N is a total number of edges. So essentially um, the way this was, uh, the, the reason chandeliers are, are still quite abundant, right? Up to uh, a leading order term inside the exponent, same as all trees is because uh, capital M will be much smaller than capital K so that most of the entropy is contributed by the bulbs, right? So most of the payload is here. Um, so you can easily check that uh, when the path is uh, shorter than the size of the bulb, uh, the cardinality grows as if as the whole tree, every tree. Okay. And the second thing is the number of automorphisms, which is basically uh, a, a condition that we will use in order to control the coefficients here, right? So, and, uh, and the thanks to our results from uh, Olsen and uh, Wagner last year, uh, who understood uh, the, uh, the number of isomorphism of a random tree drawn uniformly from the class of all unlabeled trees. And one can show that uh, the fraction of uh, trees with exponential number of automorphisms is a constant. Right, so, so there's also no compromise in terms of these not too symmetric trees. So overall, that's that's that, uh, and then, so uh, in the end, what we were able to show, and I'll explain very briefly later uh, why this structure is beneficial, uh, is is the following. So the variance over the first moment square uh, does have this behavior that we wanted. And then once we choose rho to be bigger than root alpha, so that this grows exponentially in n, and then upon choosing n to be log n, right, log number of uh, vertices, we can make this little of one over n square, right? So essentially we can ensure a uh, number of uh, mismatches happens with probability goes to zero just by applying a naive union bound over n, n pairs. And then for true matches, uh, this quantity is only controlled at some little of one. So that's why we only able to conclude, uh, uh, you know, we can match all but a vanishing fraction of vertices. So there could be a number of errors, but then this can be boosted to, uh, to everything using a, uh, the idea of the seeded graph matching, right? Use this as a seed uh, under the, uh, whenever this is information theory possible, basically. So, Right, so this is the picture. And then, yeah, that's what I mentioned. Okay. 
So the reason this uh, structure helps um, is the following. Um, yeah, perhaps maybe at the, so there's a few reasons this thing helps. Uh, maybe let me just isolate one of them. So when you compute the second moment, you need to expand these sums. Right? So, so, so this uh, sums is over the shapes, right? In the, in, in the family, in the family of subgraphs that you choose is, and then you go over all possible uh, pairs in the second, uh, in the first and the second graph, isomorphic to the template that you choose is H and I, right? So essentially there are four uh, copies here. And then you need to compute the covariance between these uh, sign the subgraph products, essentially. So some simple bound, which is not what we actually did, uh, but kind of make a, made a, make a, makes a point here, is that you can control this covariance by the number of edges in the union of these four copies, right? So this, so essentially what happens is that if you think about I equal to J, Right, so this is a, the picture of the two pairs, right? Let's say pi is identity. You have uh, four chandeliers hanging at the same point. And these wires could be uh, twisted in arbitrary ways. They, they intersect the bulbs and so on and so forth. So you need to understand uh, this type of overlapping patterns, right? They enumerate, let's say, according to a number of edges of these unions. Uh, and then hopefully this sum is comparable to the first moment squared or much smaller. So uh, the, the way you can uh, understood this overlapping pattern is to represent this as a graph decorated with four colors because there are four copies. And there is a lot of structural constraint that comes from the fact that this, when is this covariance zero or not? For example, you can show that unless the edge, every edge has two colors at least, uh, the contribution is zero. And then there's a lot of other things that you can use in enumeration. Um, and the reason uh, this, this long branch, this long wires helps, uh, perhaps can be explained uh, superficially from the following angle. Um, so this is a picture where I only look at two chandeliers. Uh, so in, in principle, you need to look at four. Uh, but the fact that, uh, and you can imagine that they will eventually be hanging at the same node, let's say I, just to simplify the mental picture. So one can show that if their overlaps doesn't contribute to any cycle, and that is the hard part. If it does, then you can show that its contribution can be bounded uh, using more primitive methods. Uh, but when the unions of these two things are trees, this is the dominating term to the second moment. And then the, the help that comes from the chandelier structure is the following. And suppose uh, that uh, you have two bulbs intersecting. And then uh, if they does intersect and without creating uh, a cycle, this very long path must completely coincide. And this reduced a lot of entropy, in fact, by a factor of some, something exponential in the length of this path. Uh, when you enumerate uh, this type of unions, right? So this is a very, very quick explanation of this fact. And this was exploited basically at the heart of this enumeration. Okay, and then in the end, you can show that when you choose these parameters carefully, number of branches is a large constant, uh, size of the bulb is log n, and the, the path, the, the length of the wire is a little of the size of the bulb, by a log factor, and this does everything that you need. Okay. Very good, so let me maybe conclude. Uh, so I think nice takeaway message is this phase diagram in terms of when is it possible, easy or hard. Um, and the, the open problem that I to mention uh, pertaining to this work and also at the bigger field of random graph matching uh, are the following. Uh, prove or give rigorous evidence to the computational hardness when rho is less than square root of alpha when the graph are sparse in the sense that the average degree is poly log n or maybe n to the little of one. And then uh, there is a lot of already uh, results that suggest, or in, the, in fact proves, uh, auto threshold doesn't kick in, uh, de delineating what is possible computationally for dense graphs. So in fact, for dense graphs, by which I mean the average degree is a constant, it's possible to achieve uh, in polynomial time uh, reconstruction of the matching, 
when rho is an arbitrary small constant. And this was shown, I mean, related results were shown by uh, Jen Ding and his students last year uh, for a Gaussian model, replacing correlated Bernoulli by correlated Gaussians. And very recently uh, by Zhong Yang Li uh, for the correlated uh, Erich Rain graph uh, for some edge densities. Okay. Uh, but uh, the conjecture is that uh, for sparse graphs, uh, author's threshold is actually the sharp computational limit. And th there's also uh, uh, related questions uh, matching random graphs beyond other drain graphs, because these are definitely not good models for, let's say, mesh networks come from computer vision type of applications that are not other drain like at all. And finally, I think a very uh, important question in this field is understood the theoretical guarantees for more practical algorithms, right? So the algorithms that are presented are uh, th theoretically polynomial time. Uh, it's not easy to implement. Uh, and there are practical polynomial time algorithms. Uh, it, it numerically, does very well. It, it, essentially, there is a natural convex relaxations for uh, the maximum likelihood that does extremely well in practice. And what we only know are uh, results uh, about these further relaxations. Um, okay, so I'd like to end my talk here. Thank you very much.